Chapter 7 Taking it to the next level Twin Forks Take a deep breath. You have now read through an extraordinary number of ways in which the law produces ambiguous situations that will provide ammunition for your professors to construct exams. So we have some more good news. Our experience has been that most law students actually become quite good at mastering the forms of ambiguity we have described. Some get there sooner than others, and so one thing you want to do is develop study techniques that speed your ability to spot exam issues. We'll talk more about that in parts Roman 2 and Roman 3. Typical issue spotting exams, however like actual law practice, are yet more difficult than may be suggested by a description of any particular fork. That's because many exam questions will throw more than one ambiguity at you simultaneously. This is the phenomenon of twin forks to which we have referred in earlier chapters and that we are now ready to tackle directly. Return once again then, to the classic example famously analyzed by Lon Fuller and HLA, heart of a rule banning vehicles in the park. We have explained at least two different ways you might discuss the question whether the prohibition applies to a motorized wheelchair. Let's give tricycles a rest for a moment. First, you might talk about the right way to interpret the underlying rule. Should it be read through the lens of plain meaning, or with its broader purpose in mind, from the perspective of this fork in the law, the focus will be on reading the legal materials to find clues within them about the intentions of the statutory drafters. And you can almost imagine the particular example of the motorized wheelchair lurking in the background, while the foreground debate concerns what the law is. Under either the plain meaning or purpose-based alternative, however, you must still address the proper treatment of the wheelchair, the problem we've called a fork in the facts. There is no ready-made answer to whether particular things are literally vehicles that can be invoked to solve the wheelchair case. Is a toy car a vehicle if its wheels spin? What if they don't? And if the rule is read according to purpose, let's say keeping the park quiet, is a motorized wheelchair too noisy? And of course, these issues don't even include the obvious point that the rule could be supported by other purposes, such as keeping the park safe. This kind of issue within an issue is what makes the vehicle example so engaging and we think helps account for its lasting power as an educational tool. We're calling issues within issues twin forks to highlight that you must choose one side or the other, and then either side you choose, you must choose again. Not all your professors will be as jurisprudentially inclined as Hart and Fuller were, but all of them will take advantage of twin forks as perhaps the core technique in drafting an exam question. If it's not explained to you, and certainly no one ever explained it to us, it can throw you for a loop. Once you understand it, however, it will look like a life raft rather than a dreaded source of confusion. Take, then, a typical problem of the kind you'd expect to find on an exam. You know that your child was beaten up in the local public school, and that the prospective buyer of your house has children he intends to send there. As a seller of the home, do you have an obligation to disclose the violent incident? Suppose you were sure about the law. Let's say you knew that in the relevant jurisdiction home sellers are under a duty to disclose all information pertinent to the market value of their home. You might still be unsure about the correct answer to the exam question. So you might offer your professor a discussion about whether one violent incident is a sufficient basis for concluding that there's anything wrong with a school that is otherwise attractive to the buyer. Your child may be particularly prone to fighting, or there may just be one bully around who is about to graduate, as you show the ambiguity in the application of the market value rule to these facts. You score points merrily along the way. Now suppose instead that you didn't notice the possibility that one incident might not be indicative of a threat to the home's value. Instead, you simply assumed that this incident would be something you must disclose under a rule based on market value. But you are entirely unsure of what the law really is in the relevant jurisdiction. You remember the cases and don't really know whether they support a rule that requires disclosure of anything that affects market value or merely disclosure of defects in the house that affect market value. So you might offer your professor a discussion about the best way to read the cases. The facts in all the cases may involve defects in the house, 
but the expressed rationales appear to extend to all information about market value. You might raise slippery slope questions like whether you would be under an obligation to disclose information from a study you just read casting doubt on the future economy of the state. Again, you'd be merrily racking up points as you focus like a laser beam on this one particular ambiguity in the law. Now let's suppose that neither issue escapes you. You have the sinking feeling as you read the question that you aren't sure quite what the law is defects or market value. Nor are you sure whether even if you knew the law, you'd know how to resolve the case. Could defects be extended to cover things about the local school? Will the market value of the house really hinge on one incident? Remember that from the professor's perspective your ability to spot both sources of ambiguity makes you a good student. That's why our book is called Getting to Maybe. But from your own internal perspective, especially if you haven't thought much about exams, you have every reason to feel confused. As you may see it, there are two things you are supposed to know. What's the law? And how does it apply? Gasp. You're not sure about either one. Once again, however, you know more than you think you do about this twin fork. Much more. And here's what you know. You know that resolution of the issues you have identified will get you to a result in the case. So you know that if the rule is market value, and the violent incident is significant, then the seller must disclose. You know that if the rule is market value, but the incident isn't significant, then disclosure's not required. You know that if the rule is to disclose defects, and defects is read narrowly, disclosure won't be necessary because the school is not the house. You also know that if defects is read as a surrogate for any information, the seller may have special access to as a result of living in the house, then disclosure may be required. If you tell your professor all these things, and then you also give some reasons that courts might embrace each of the possible interpretations, your answer will be very well received. We promise. We'll talk more in part room and two about what reasons supporting differing interpretations might look like. For now, however, we want to show you enough examples of twin forks so that they will come to seem routine. A. Linked forks. One good fork deserves another recall, our very first example of forks in the road. Paul Patron offers Arlene Artiste dollar ten thousand to paint a portrait of the Patron family. Artiste explains that her other commitments make it impossible for her to promise a completed work by a particular date, and Patron responds. I don't want your commitment, I just want the portrait. After Artiste spends numerous hours doing preliminary sketches, but before she has put brush to canvas and begun the actual portrait patron advises her that he has changed his mind and is revoking the offer. What legal rights does Artiste have against patron? You will recall that we saw two different forks in this hypothetical. First we saw a fork in the law that matched the common law rule an offer to make a unilateral contract may be revoked at any time before acceptance is complete against 45 of the second restatement of contracts, an offerer may not revoke once offeree begins performance. Then we saw a fork in the facts. Did the preliminary sketches constitute a beginning of performance under 45, or were they mere preparations before performance was actually begun? In terms of scoring points on an exam, it's obviously twice as good to see two issues than to see only one. But the message of this chapter is that you are better off still if you can see relationships between issues. For one thing, seeing the relationship between different issues will sharpen your understanding of their significance and hence the analysis you provide in your answer. For another, relationships between issues appear in patterns on law exams and studying these patterns will enhance your ability to recognize issues in the first place. Consider then, the relationship between the two issues we've identified in the artist Epitron illustration, for it is an extremely common one on law exams. The professor drafts a problem presenting a rule vs. counter rule issue, but when you start to apply the rules to the facts presented in the problem, you encounter a second issue frequently a fork in the facts. We call this a linked forks pattern because one of the roads you encounter at the first fork leads directly to a second fork. Thus, in the artist Epitron case, either the common law rule or the rule from Restatement 45 might apply. If we apply the common law rule to the facts, 
the analysis comes to an end, for the offer is free to revoke. But if we apply 45 to the facts, we encounter a second issue, and the analysis must continue. If the sketch work is the beginning of performance, then artiste is protected against revocation. But if the sketch work is mere preparations, then patron is free to revoke. The links may not stop there. Assume we have a question presenting a slight variation on the facts we've examined thus far. Paul Patron offers Arlene Artiste dollar ten thousand to paint a portrait of the Patron family. Artiste explains that her other commitments make it impossible for her to promise a completed work by a particular date, and Patron responds, I don't want your commitment, I just want the portrait. After Artiste spends numerous hours doing preliminary sketches, but before she has put brush to canvas and begun the actual portrait patron advises her that he has changed his mind and is revoking the offer. Artiste continues work on the project, in spite of patron's purported revocation. She finishes the portrait, but citing patron's attempt to back out of the deal, she refuses to sign it. Patron rejects delivery of the portrait, and Artiste sues for breach of contract. What result? Let's analyze the variation step by step. Once again, we begin with the rule vs. Counter rule fork. Once again, there is a link between one of the rules i.e. 45 and a second issue, beginning of performance vs. Mere preparations. And once again, if the sketch work is mere preparations, then patron is free to revoke and our analysis comes to an end. But did you see that the facts we've added create a link to yet another issue? Thus, if the sketch work does constitute the beginning of performance under 45, then we confront yet another fork in the facts. Under Restatement 45, patron's duty to pay for the portrait is conditional on completion of the invited performance in accordance with the terms of the offer. Did artiste meet this condition? If so, then patron would seem to be liable for the promised $10,000. But if Artiste's refusal to sign the portrait violates the terms of the offer, then Patron is still home free at least until Artiste relents and signs. The classic issue spotter question on law exams has multiple links like this, and in our experience students needlessly miss the second and third and fourth links because they think they are through when they identify the first one. We discuss this common mistake at greater length in Part Roman 2 of the book. But you can avoid that problem by learning to recognize this linked forks pattern and looking for it on your exams. B. Reciprocal forks. Back and forth between law and facts recall another hypothetical from an earlier chapter. Horace Wholesaler receives an order from Reba Retailer for 50 high-end audio components at a total price of $20,000. Wholesaler sends Retailer an acknowledgement of order by email promising immediate shipment of the ordered goods. Prior to shipment, wholesaler reneges on the deal. Retailer sues, but wholesaler asserts that the UCC statute of frauds bars the claim. What result? The question, you may also recall, is whether the email message constitutes a signed writing under 2201 of the UCC. One issue of fork in the law involving competing interpretations is whether we give the signed writing requirement of that provision a plain meaning or a purpose-based interpretation. Under a plain meaning interpretation, you can almost hear Clint Eastwood. Read my lips. It says signed writing. By contrast, under a purpose-based interpretation, we might conclude that the goal of avoiding testimonial disputes about the existence and terms of a contractual commitment is served perfectly well by any verifiable record of the transaction in question, including a saved email message. But let's say we follow the plain meaning path at the fork. Is the case over, or is there another issue? We may have a fork in the facts as well. On the one hand, an email message that appears only as an electronically generated image on the screen of a computer monitor is an awful long way from ink on paper. On the other hand, Email is generated by the same means i.e., typing words on a keyboard as most writing, and can be reformatted and printed out on paper as easily as it can be saved to the hard drive. Maybe we'll get to make Clint's day after all. Indeed, 
that debate might lead us right back to the meaning of the term writing in the statute. After all, it's already been applied to several successive generations of technology. Handwriting, typing, word processing, and laser printing. Perhaps we've hit yet another question of competing interpretations. The dictionary meaning of writing vs. A commercial meaning that might focus on the way that people make and memorialize business deals in the late 1990s. If you're still awake, here's the larger point. One way to describe what just happened is that it is another example of linked forks. We start with a fork in the law plane meaning vs. A purpose-based interpretation of writing. The path of plane meaning links to a fork in the fax email equals writing vs. Email writing but also to another fork in the law, dictionary meaning vs. Commercial meaning of writing. But there is another, perhaps easier way to understand this example. When a legal problem forces us to apply law to facts, there are at least two ways to do that. You can hold the facts steady and ask what the law is. Here, do we give signed writing a plain meaning or a purpose-based interpretation? And if we opt for the plain meaning, do we refer to the dictionary or to the commercial context? Or you can hold the law steady and ask what the facts are. Here is email writing or not. We're sure you are thinking that it's rather artificial to speak in terms of holding facts steady while moving law or doing it the other way around. You are right. On your exams and in law practice, you'll find yourself instead moving back and forth between the law and the facts without giving the matter much conscious thought. That's why we call the analysis described here reciprocal forks, because the best answer will move back and forth from one dimension of the problem to the other. But it doesn't matter what you call it whether you think of it as a reciprocal fork, or as simply another example of linked forks, or in some other way that makes more sense to you as long as you learn to recognize the pattern in order to know it when you see it on an exam. C. Concurrent forks. Straddling a statutory boundary. Most of the statutes you study in law school, especially those you explore in your first year courses, govern subjects that were previously governed by the common law. Indeed, for most of those subjects, the common law still governs any transaction that is outside the statute, and thus the boundary between what lies inside and what lies outside the statute is a matter of some importance. Consider the following hypothetical. Betty Bookbinder enters a contract with Larry Lawyer to bind Lawyer's collection of appellate briefs in 37 matching volumes. Lawyer selects a cover from among Bookbinder's extensive selection of fine leathers and stipulates, among many other details, that his name should appear on each cover in gold 24-point old English lettering. When Bookbinder delivers the bound volumes on the promised date, Lawyer notices that his name is in 22-point lettering instead of 24-point and refuses to accept the volumes. If Bookbinder sues for breach of contract, what result? You may have recognized that the facts here are drafted to straddle the statutory boundary, distinguishing a sale of goods governed by Article Roman II of the UCC from a mere service, which is outside the code and hence governed by the common law. On the one hand, the transaction might be characterized as a sale of specially manufactured goods bookbinder, is in effect selling labor a substantial quantity of fine leather, and providing custom work to ensure a fit between the product and lawyer's needs bringing it within Article Roman II. But on the other hand, the dominant component of the transaction may be viewed as a service bookbinder is binding a collection of briefs that already belong to labor and the transaction would therefore be governed not by the statute but by the common law. In sum, the facts can be argued on either side of the statutory boundary, making this a classic fork in the facts. But you may have noticed that the hypothetical also contains a second fork, a rule vs. counter-rule issue that we have called a fork in the law. Thus, Laver's right to reject the volumes turns on whether we apply the UCC, its perfect tender rule 2601, or the common law doctrine of substantial performance. If we apply the perfect tender rule, lawyer has the right to reject the volumes because his name appeared in 22-point lettering rather than the 24-point lettering required by the contract. But if we apply the common law doctrine of substantial performance, 
we are likely to conclude that the slight defect does not constitute a material breach. On that view, lawyer cannot reject the volumes and must satisfy himself with a counterclaim for any damages he suffered as a result of the non-conformity. We call these concurrent forks, for the path you take at the fork in the facts determines the path you must choose at the fork in the law. If we characterize the transaction as a sale of goods, then the UCC, its perfect tender rule 2601 applies, and bookbinder is out of luck. But if we characterize the transaction as a service, then bookbinder may find refuge in the common law doctrine of substantial performance. You will encounter concurrent forks in most areas of legal practice and in virtually every course you take in law school. Sometimes the statutory boundary will look like the boundary between two adjacent states. On one side of the line, she's an employee protected against sexual harassment by Title Roman 7 of the Civil Rights Act. But on the other side of the line, she's an independent contractor, whose only source of legal protection against such harassment is the common law. Sometimes the statutory boundary will look more like the perimeter of an island. If the country club is inside the line, then it's a place of public accommodation, and its racially discriminatory membership policies are prohibited by the state human rights statute. But if it's outside the line, then the country club may be free to discriminate under the common law. The point, again, is to learn to recognize the larger pattern. Watch for the fork in the facts that straddles a statutory boundary, for there's almost sure to be a fork in the law lurking nearby. D. Proliferating forks. Competing domains. Believe it or not, most law professors strive to make the study of law easier rather than harder for their students. And one way we try to do that is by dividing up the subject areas we teach contracts, torts, property, etc. into discrete topics offer and acceptance, interpretation, remedies, etc. and each of those topics into subtopics e.g. money damages, specific relief, and even SM subtopics e.g. the rule of Hadley v. Baxendale, the duty to mitigate damages, etc. The advantage to dividing up our subjects this way is that it permits students to focus in on one set of rules, cases and or principles at a time and approach that is far less daunting than trying to grasp the seamless web of the law all at once and in any event, a lot easier to outline as you prepare for the final. The downside, however, is that real-world legal problems seldom fit neatly into a single section of even the most sophisticated outline. Instead, they blend and bleed from one section to another, frequently crossing even the most cherished boundaries of the course syllabus and the casebook's table of contents. As scary as that might seem to the beginning law student, the skilled lawyer welcomes the opportunity it provides to frame a case in a way that gives the greatest advantage to her client and to resist her opponent's efforts to frame the case in some other way. In an effort to assist you in developing this important skill i.e. of learning to analyze and argue your way back and forth across the boundaries, we teach you law professors frequently design fact patterns that straddle different doctrines or different cases or even different bodies of law. We refer to these as competing domains and the statutory boundary situation we just finished discussing where a hypothetical is designed to straddle the boundary between what's governed by a statute and what's governed by the common law is an important example of what we mean. Indeed, it is such an important example, and more to the point of this book, it is so frequently tested on law exams that we thought it deserved separate treatment in its own section. But there is a much longer list of competing domains problems than any book could provide. And since some of them are a bit more complex than anything we've studied so far, we offer a few examples to give you a feel for what different competing domains may look like. In contracts, you learn about the doctrine of consideration, as well as the doctrine of promissory estoppel. A classic competing domains question for that course presents a single fact pattern that straddles the two doctrines e.g. The nephew who gives up smoking in order to fulfill a condition on his uncle's promise to give him dollar five thousand and whose forbearance could thus be characterized as either bar gained for consideration or merely detrimental reliance. In property, 
You may study one case that gives a landowner the unrestricted right to pump percolating water from his property, and a second case holding a landowner liable for the subsidence of neighboring land resulting from excavation. A competing domain's question would present facts that straddle the two cases e.g. a landowner who pumps percolating water from his own land in such quantities, and in such a manner as to cause subsidence on neighboring farms. In employment law, you may study the body of case law that protects public sector employees against discharge and retaliation for exercising the right to free speech protected by the First Amendment. You may also study the common law, employment at will doctrine that would permit private sector employers to fire their employees for the same conduct. A competing domain's question would present facts that straddle the two bodies of law e.g. the discharge of a teacher at a charter school for statements she makes regarding a school bond issue, where the charter school might be characterized as either a public employer, so that the discharge would violate the First Amendment, or a private employer, so that the discharge would be lawful under the at-will rule. So why do we think problems like these involve proliferating forks? Let's take a slightly closer look at yet another competing domain's problem. Assume, for example, that in your torts course you studied a case imposing on property owners a duty of reasonable care regarding property conditions for the protection of their business invitees, and a second case holding that a landowner owes no such duty to a social guest since the latter is considered a mere licensee. A question on the final presence, a fact pattern that straddles the two cases. Frida Friend comes to Homer homeowner's house for a Tupperware party, so she's right on the line between a business invitee and a social guest, and during her visit, she sustains an injury that results from homeowner's lack of due care regarding the condition of the property. Consider the issues that will arise when you analyze this problem. Obviously, we have a fork in the facts. Friend might be characterized as either a business invitee or a social guest. But do you see that we also have concurrent forks? As in our statutory boundary case, the path you take at the fork in the facts determines the path you must choose at the fork in the law. If we characterize the injured party as a business invitee, then homeowner owed her a duty of care and its breach is actionable. But if we characterize the injured party as a social guest, then homeowner owed her no such duty, and the result is damnum absc injuria. But we're not finished yet, for there are reciprocal forks buried in this hypothetical as well. As in our hypo dealing with email under the statute of frauds, we can hold the law steady and take the facts back and forth between the business invitee and the social guest characterizations. But we can also hold the facts steady, and see whether there is also more than one way to read the law. Perhaps you can offer a broad reading of the business invitee case, so that it clearly covers the Tupperware party, and thus enables friend to recover. And perhaps you can likewise offer a narrow interpretation of the social guest case that will permit you to distinguish friend's situation. On the other hand, perhaps you can narrow the former case and broaden the latter, and thus reach the opposite result. In sum, the competing domains case presents two patterns that we've already explored concurrent forks and reciprocal forks, but the rub is that it presents both patterns simultaneously. Need to see it again. In the case of the discharged teacher, there are concurrent forks if the charter school is a public employer. Then the First Amendment prohibits retaliation for free speech. But if it's a private employer, then discharge is permissible under the at-will rule and also reciprocal forks you can try to broaden and narrow the cases that define public and private employers to cover or distinguish the charter school at issue here. Apart from learning to recognize a fact pattern straddling competing domains, the key to success on questions like these is to sort carefully through the different forks in play and to avoid getting tangled up in knots, a point we'll return to in Part Roman II of the book, E. Hidden Forks. Dodging the statue. Imagine that you are taking your property final and that you encounter an exam question in which a large corporation wants to purchase the land. It is leasing from a farm family of modest means. Hoping for the return of better times or a much better price, the family has thus far refused to sell. The roof of an abandoned farm building on the leased property is leaking badly and would cost the family about $30,000 to repair. 
although the large corporation has no use for the building in question. It cites the leak and invokes the provisions of a landlord-tenant statute to excuse further payment of rent, hoping to force the family into selling the property at a bargain price. A quick review persuades you that under a plain meaning interpretation of the statute, the family can kiss its farm goodbye. But two considerations persuade you that there must be more to the exam question than this. For one thing, the professor spent a lot of time in class stressing the fact that the statute in question was the result of years of lobbying and protest activity on the part of community groups representing low-income tenants. Surely their supporters in the legislature would never have dreamed that their handiwork could be used in this way. For another thing, you have 45 minutes to deal with this question, and a look at your watch reveals that you've got 39 of them left. So there simply must be a way to approach the problem beyond the straightforward conclusion that the farm family loses because the statute says so. Fortunately, you've read Getting to Maybe, and so you know what to look for. If a plain meaning interpretation of the statute works against the family, perhaps they can invoke the history and purposes the professor emphasized to argue the case the other way. Recalling the things you can do with the word vehicle, you begin to wonder whether the corporate lessee is the kind of tenant the statute was designed to protect, or whether the provision excusing rent payments in the face of serious defects was intended to apply to unoccupied buildings. But now that you think about it, you recall reading a case for class that held that a corporate lessee specifically, a law firm providing legal services to the poor, was a tenant within the meaning of the statute. And you recall a second case involving an abandoned structure that posed hazards to the tenant's children that extended a landlord's obligations to vacant buildings on the rental property. That wily law professor has drafted the question in a way that seems to paint you into a corner. Whatever will you do? As they say in the movies, what you need to do is get the hell out of Dodge. And in this case Dodge is the statute. In fact, what you need to do is what we call dodging the statute. And it is really just a variation on the sort of purpose-based arguments we've already used to deal with particular words or phrases or provisions that appear in a statute. The difference here is that you use the purpose-based argument to claim that the statute doesn't apply to the case before you at all, because the concerns that prompted the legislature to enact the statute are not even remotely present on the facts. We're not saying this argument is always or even usually a winner. What we are saying is that it is a perfectly respectable argument that a skilled laver representing the farm family is likely to make in the circumstances. The first lawyer who argued that 2207 of the UCC, which by its terms covers all non conforming acceptances, doesn't apply unless the parties are entering a transaction via pre printed forms, went out on precisely this limb. Yet there's now a growing body of case law accepting that argument. So why do we deal with this problem in a chapter called Twin Forks? We've already discussed the competing interpretations fork. A plain meaning application the corporate tenant is permitted to invoke the statute to withhold payment of rent vs. Dodging the statute, the statute doesn't apply because it wasn't intended to cover a case like this. But if we dodge the statute, what law governs? Like the statutory boundary situation we discussed earlier, if we take the case out of the statute, we typically find ourselves back in the familiar environs of the common law. Sometimes, getting back to the common law will lead directly to a result. In our example, if the lease is silent on the issue, you might conclude that the common law would treat the mutual obligations of landlord and tenant as independent covenants. This would mean that the corporate tenant would be obligated to continue paying the rent in spite of the farm family's failure to ensure that all the buildings on the leased property were safe and in good repair. It's quite possible, however, that the common law rule protecting tenants would go well beyond the terms of the statute and relieve the corporation of its rent obligation until the farm was placed in reasonable or habitable condition. So dodging the statute a tactic that is easy to miss since we normally think of statutes as unavoidable may be a good strategy, but not the end of the story. Once again, it's worth focusing on the larger pattern. The choice you make at the competing interpretations fork, do we follow the plain meaning and apply the statute, 
or do we invoke its purposes to avoid it? Determines the choice with respect to a different fork in the law, if the statute applies, its rules govern the transaction. If it doesn't, the case is governed by the common law. Note finally another aspect of the argument around the statute. Taking the holdings of the cases individually made things seem impossible when you considered the separate holdings that commercial tenants are protected and that unoccupied buildings are covered. Yet viewing each of these holdings as the furthest a court might go from the statute's core purpose i.e., protecting vulnerable tenants made it possible to argue that combining them to cover your facts would contravene statutory intent. See our discussion of multiple cases back in Chapter 5. Our background v. foreground. Variations on the twin forks theme. Our experience is that the majority of exam questions include twin or multiple forks in which each branch you choose has a direct bearing on the ultimate outcome of a dispute. So if you pick one version of the law, the case will come out one way. And if you pick the alternative legal rule or interpretation, you'll get the opposite result. Ditto for the facts. As we move into our discussion of exam preparation and answer construction, however, we must stress an important point regarding the many ambiguities that we have identified. Not every choice you face on an exam will present you with what we have called a fork. Many times your discussion will begin by spotting a fork. Should I read the case narrowly or broadly? Should I read the statute literally or with purpose in mind? But as you write your answer, you must go beyond identifying the various alternatives along the branches of what we have called forks. You must also craft arguments favoring one side and the other, and this means choosing which arguments to make on behalf of which side of each fork. As a general rule, your strategy will be to include as many persuasive arguments as possible, and we have devoted all of Chapter 10 to identifying arguments likely to be available to you. Occasionally, however, your argument selection will link back to the legal choices you confront. This presents professors with delicious opportunities for questions with a twist. Suppose a workplace regulation requires that all employees wear safety glasses at all times while on the premises. One employee's son is injured while dining in the cafeteria when a freak explosion causes flying debris to hit him in the eye. The employer charged with a violation for failing to ensure glasses were worn, may rely on a literal reading of the statute to exclude the son, not an employee. Yet the employer may also consider arguing that the cafeteria, while literally on the premises, is not meant to be within the rubric of the statute. Let's say no one ever wears safety glasses in there. Similarly, the plaintiff may argue that the statute should be extended to include visitors, since their eyes are just as much at risk. Yet the plaintiff may argue that the phrase premises should be read literally to include the cafeteria. You'll score a lot of points with your professor if you notice that each party is being pushed to make seemingly contradictory arguments, we'll call them conflicting styles on different points. We appreciate the added layer of complexity that attention to this sort of detail involves. But if it's any solace, lawyers often make arguments of conflicting styles in the same case without anyone's noticing. Some areas of law, however, like constitutional law, demand that special attention be paid to the style as well as the substance of each argument. Tough questions in constitutional law almost always require discussion on at least two levels. You must analyze the particular problem at hand in light of constitutional text and existing precedent, and you may need to invoke more general arguments about the appropriate style of reasoning. This will include reference to topics such as whether the document should be read through the lens of original intent or more as a living, breathing document. Consider the litigation that will almost certainly reach the Supreme Court, and in the meantime will be tested on scores of exams concerning the constitutionality of racial preferences in admission to universities. Both supporters and opponents of preferences have strong arguments referring back to constitutional text, history, and precedent. Supporters of preferences can cite regents of the University of California v. Back, 438 U.S., 265, 1978, seemingly upholding some preference on grounds of diversity, and can also rely on the general purpose of the 14th Amendment to improve the situation of African Americans. 
Opponents can point to the literal language of the Equal Protection Clause, and to many cases casting a pall on all kinds of race discrimination. Yet supporters and opponents can also rely on arguments that sound more like interpreting the Constitution in light of the times. Supporters of racial preferences can stress the disastrous resegregation of universities that might result from a constitutional ban on racial preferences. Opponents of preferences may stress the progress society has made in overcoming racism and the present need to move quickly toward color blindness. In quickly writing an exam answer about racial preferences, it would be tempting, and in many ways satisfactory, simply to include both sets of arguments, the appeal to text, history and precedent on the one hand, and the appeal to the current needs of the nation on the other on both sides. But constitutional law is argued best by stopping to consider whether one kind of argument you assert will ultimately undermine another. As a preference opponent, for example, if you want to rely heavily on the literal language of the document, you may not want also to rely on recent progress. Making the latter argument may hint that you don't think the literal language point is sufficient and open the door for others to disagree on how much progress really has been made. And as a preference supporter, you may worry that an emphasis on the consequences of desegregation may detract from your own efforts to find help in the constitutional language and history. This last twin fork, then, forms a perfect transition into Part Roman II of this book. For it illustrates that law, especially as it is tested on law school exams, is always as much about crafting arguments as it is about spotting issues. You can't make arguments until you spot the issues, but there's plenty left to do once you have. 